I am honored to introduce um, two of our three presenters at this point. Um, and I'd just like to tell you a little bit about these individuals. And the first person that I would like to um, introduce that I think everyone here probably already knows is Mrs. Jane Calloway. Um, she has been a trained facilitator for the HBN network, for Hearing Voices Network, commonly known as HBN. Um, and it's for groups living with mental, uh, groups living with a mental health diagnosis. 2005 is when she started. She attended the HBN International Con Congress in 2017. And last February actually trained, went down to Florida um, to uh, facilitate HVN friends and family groups. We welcome Jane Cowley. She has been a, a dear, dear supporter advocate for our affiliate in NAMI Coastal Virginia. And to say that we are lucky would be an absolute understatement. Um, the next individual who is not yet with us, I think due to some uh, technical issues, but I think we'll be able to join is Mr. Tevin Clark. Um, he is also a voice here who traveled to Florida with the Calloway family actually in February training to facilitate HVN groups um, for people who live with a mental health diagnosis. And with that, the last but definitely not the least person I'd like to introduce, and I got the opportunity to meet her just this evening, is Cindy Marty, who is a voice here, who is trained, uh, who is a trainer for HVN USA and has facilitated HVN groups for years. Cindy is a parent as well, and has experienced supporting her five children through a variety of extreme experiences. So Cindy brings with her an incredible amount of lived experience as well as knowledge and her role as a leader as a facilitator and presenter for HBN. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Cindy um, right before we show a film, which she has mentioned took quite a bit to produce. So Cindy, take it away. Hi, I'm Cindy Marty Hodge. Uh, in the film, I'm, I'm mostly seen as Marty in there. Um, somebody who's had the experience of hearing things and seeing things that, you know, other people around me weren't seeing. And um, people are welcome in the groups. I just want to clarify whether or not they've ever had a diagnosis. There are some people who have these experiences who, who never end up uh, in the mental health system for whatever reason, they're able to navigate them without getting into the amount of distress that would land them in services. And this movie was funded by the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health in the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community of which I'm a part of, uh, partnered with Gail Hornstein, a Mount Holyoke College professor. And uh, we put together this film, it represents people from uh, across the country. And I would love to just show the film because it, it does the job of explaining what the Hearing Voices approach is. And then we can talk afterwards and I would invite people to put questions in the chat. I also want people to know that this is being recorded. So, you know, you might feel better putting it in the chat or not, but just a, a heads up to know that it is being recorded. Thank you, Cindy. Jessica, if you could roll the film, that would be terrific. You got it. And just FYI, I'm going to have everybody muted during this just because for recording purposes, um, if people say something, then that pops up on the screen other than the video. And I want as many people to be able to see it as possible and hear it. So I'm going to use my executive power and mute all of you. <laughs> Early on, when I was a child, my grandmother told me that it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Back then, um, 
my voices were uh, really positive. They were uh, advice givers, and they usually gave me really good advice. It wasn't until I got older, after my son was born, that the voices were negative, were they were distressing. They were telling me terrible things about myself. When the first voices external to myself started, they were basically questioning me. And everything that they said was related to the things that I was feel, thinking and feeling about myself. So it was completely understandable. The scary part was that they were voices in my environment rather than my own inner voice. When I was first hearing your voice, I believed it was my conscience. I was told that your conscience talks to you, so I thought that was normal. <laughs> and as I got older, about you know, 16 or so, I realized it wasn't my conscience. I did not tell anybody that I heard a voice. and. Basically believed I was alone and that nobody else heard voices. Hearing voices throughout my life has been an experience that I have lived with in silence for a great period of my life. And that was because I couldn't make sense of the voices in my head. I couldn't understand them, so I didn't think anybody else could. In a culture like ours in the U.S., when people report unusual experiences like hearing voices or having visions, it's usually assumed to be the sign of a serious psychological problem. If the person is distressed by these experiences and goes to a psychiatrist, they're likely to get a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Doctors stress that voices or visions are hallucinations, that they're not real, and the best response is to take a medication to try to block them out. Here in the U.S., people are typically prescribed many different psychiatric drugs, often at the same time. They are urged to ignore their voices and to regard what they say as meaningless, like the random firing of brain circuits. I got the message that because I heard voices, there was something wrong with me. It wasn't that there was something wrong with the people that were hurting me. To tell me that what I was thinking or feeling, either uh, like it wasn't real or to ignore it, or um, it was almost sometimes like I felt like they were saying I was lying. She said to me, what it means, Caroline, is that you have a neurodegenerative disease. If you don't take these medications, you're going to get sicker and sicker, and your brain is going to further degrade. It was really scary to hear that, but the truth was that my brain didn't degrade, and I'm actually feeling a lot more clear-headed without the use of the heavy neuroleptic drugs. She wasn't ready for her <laughs> She, because I said I was hearing voices, thought I was suicidal and insisted that I be um, either commit myself or be committed to a psychiatric hospital for observation. I can remember someone telling me, you know, expect to be in and out of the hospital every year and be grateful for, you know, these small periods of time when you're not institutionalized. So when I was a kid, I would go out to the breakfast table and there would be my cereal bowl and next to it, there would be a plate of pills. Always medication. If this one's not working, try another one. That's not working, we'll up the dose. <laughs> really just this idea that the voices just needed to go away. Um, that there was nothing positive that could come from them, um, that they weren't real, that they couldn't have a meaning that would be helpful to me in my life. This assumption that voices are meaningless and pathological is common in the U.S., but in many other countries around the world, people are being offered a different perspective called the hearing voices approach. It got its start 
when a Dutch psychiatrist named Marius Rom started listening to one of his patients, Patsy Haga, in a very different way from how he had been trained. I was trained as a psychiatrist, like still everybody's trained, and that means that hearing voices is a defect in somebody's brain. I began to hear voices when I was about eight years old, and that was the age uh, on which I was severely burned. Patsy heard voices that told her to kill herself. Rom felt that he had no choice but to hospitalize her. No treatment seemed to help. Then one day, in desperation, he decided to try something radically different. He got Patsy together with several other patients who also heard voices in the hope that they might understand her better than he did. To Rom's astonishment, this actually seemed to work. These patients opened up to one another in new ways, and knowing that they weren't alone made them feel less isolated and strange. Patsy had long insisted that what she needed was a focus on the voices themselves and a recognition that her experience was real. Rom's partner, Sandra Escher, who at the time was a science journalist, arranged for Marius and Patsy to appear together on a popular television talk show. Viewers were asked to call the station after the program if they had personal experience of voices. Within a few days, hundreds of people had called, many of whom were themselves voice hearers. Then, an astonishing fact emerged. More than a third of those who said they regularly heard voices had never had any connection to the mental health system. They hadn't seen psychiatrists or been given any kind of diagnosis. They were just living ordinary lives. Rahm and Escher and their colleagues have now devoted more than 25 years to studying the differences between these two groups, the voice hearers who become psychiatric patients and those who don't. It turns out that the biggest difference has to do with how each group understands and copes with their voices. This work has inspired the development of the Hearing Voices Network, HVN. All over the world, voice hearers and their families along with clinicians and mental health researchers, are working collaboratively to expand a network of peer support groups where people can gain a deeper understanding of their own experiences and learn to integrate them into a full life. This new approach contradicts a long-held assumption of Western psychiatry that talking about voices will make the person worse. Instead of seeing voices as a sign of illness, or something that should simply be gotten rid of, hearing voices groups help people to uncover the meanings of these experiences and the contexts in which they are most likely to occur. As a result, many people learn to cope more effectively with their voices or stop hearing them entirely. These groups also welcome those who experience visions or other unusual states, not just voices per se. I think is uh, every city should have voice hearing groups. Number one, because it's something that people don't talk about, and it's psychologists. Psychiatrists don't deal with voices. Number one, they just don't deal with that. By having an open space where you discuss your voices, how you feel, how they make you feel, and being able to talk about your voices, no, no matter how bad they are, because you got people that who understand what you're going through, and they can relate to this. And really, it was through working with the Hearing Voices Network, that I learned how to have a relationship with my voices. I learned how to negotiate uh, with them and to work with them to figure out why they said what they said, the way they said what they said, um, and to discover a meaning for the voices. I learned more things that I never thought you know, say so I learned how to control my voice. I learned how to how to uh, love myself by coming to the groups and being able to explore what my voices meant, the context of the distress, things that had gone on in my life that both were and weren't related to my voices. I was able to renegotiate the power balance between my voices and I, and learn that really we were on the same side. The first thing they asked me was. 
what happened to you? They didn't say what was wrong with you. It changed my total mindset about who I was. Because I was always told me, told me I would never have a great job. I would never be a great dad. There's plaques all through Canada with my family's name. All by uh, different names. Cool. Yeah, it's cool. There's actually... When the voices started saying really mean and untrue things about me, I was able to say, wait, this, this isn't right. You know, it isn't true. And so as a result, I was able to stand up to them. So when I first went to groups, I didn't say anything because I didn't trust anybody. So I was afraid to actually say what my experience was or what I was going through because I had gotten such uh, unwanted results from doing that. So it took a while of uh, listening and watching other people. And then when I could see that other people went through similar things and that they had figured out ways of navigating it, people were creating lives. My life changed dramatically because... The voices that used to taunt me all the time, to beat me up, they don't do that anymore. Because the simple fact, I'm sharing my experience with other people when I went through with my voice. If I saw you come back, I would cry. <laughs> A big thing for me was knowing that I wasn't alone, not being judged. A place that I could talk freely, not worrying about. Am I going to end up in the hospital? It's giving me clarity. That's giving me more stability, more confidence. Um, I was shy. Now I can speak out loud. It's, it's really giving me back my sense of self. I spent years, even decades, of trying to run away from distressing voices. And it just didn't work. Through hearing voices groups, I learned there can be a value to stopping to quit trying to ignore, block, and run from distressing voices, and to instead face them. The groups helped me to realize that these negative voices were actually echoing messages from my childhood. And that was a really helpful thing to know. Over time, examining those messages and ultimately rejecting the beliefs they were based on was even more helpful. Many people who participate in hearing voices groups have also been in traditional treatment groups run by mental health professionals. They often talk about the many ways in which these groups are different. I remember the first time I came to a group and it was completely different from any sort of clinical group I had ever been to. Um, we were having a dialogue, people genuinely liked each other, people were friends, and people shared experiences um, that were so deep and so beautiful and um, also had very different frameworks for understanding them, but there was never anyone trying to put that framework on someone else. And that's another big thing with the group is it's not a forced group. Everybody is there because they want to be there. One of the things that I really appreciate about hearing voices groups is that when you come in, it's not like there are these people over here who are the helpers and who have completely recovered and who have all the information and then these people over here who are the ones receiving help. Um, it feels like sort of no matter where we are in our journeys, we're all working together to share stories and share strategies and collectively create the lives that we want to live. One of the most important functions of hearing voices groups is that they provide an opportunity to share concrete strategies for coping with voices that are distressing. The assumption is that different strategies will work for different people or even for the same person at different times. By taking a curious and non-judgmental attitude, the group allows participants to discover what works best for each of them personally. What's worked well is to address them from a place of strength. Um, but it's really hard to get things like strength, purpose, meaning, and connection uh, from a prescription. They gave me techniques, like if I hear my voices and I want to talk back to them, I shut my phone off totally, I walk down the street, it's like, no, 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 you argue with the person, but no one knows that I'm hearing voices, they think I'm having a conversation on the phone. I dropped out of four colleges because of my voices. If I had voice in groups back then, maybe I have a degree by now. And that haunts me sometimes. What I realized is that when I am hearing a voice that's telling me that I should die, it usually means that there is something in my life that needs to die. 
Uh, it's not that my literal heart needs to stop beating, but there's usually a role or a relationship or something I'm doing that needs to end so that I can go on living. And HVN has been an incredible resource for me in being able to understand the metaphor and deeper messages of voices. I think it's a lot easier to discover those things when you're feeling supported by a community and when you're doing it in conversation with people who also have the wisdom of, you know, walking through darkness and struggle. The Hearing Voices Network and its peer support groups have spread to 30 countries around the world and are beginning to make a real difference here in the U.S. There are now more than 100 in-person and online groups across the country and trainings for new facilitators of these groups who can be voice hearers, mental health professionals, family members, or peer advocates are taking place in many locations. Even people who have been in the mental health system for years, who have been prescribed many different drugs or been hospitalized multiple times, are finding their lives significantly changed. As a voice hearer, I was trying to find resources that could help me understand my experiences better. And so I went online and just started looking around and found the Hearing Voices Network and um, was just overwhelmed um, and joyful, really, that there was such a thing. The Hearing Voices Network has really made me feel a part of a community. You know, what I find so welcoming about HBN is that I'm allowed to be a spiritual being and have a spiritual perspective on my voices. I used to be someone that was afraid to leave my house. Um, I used to be someone that, you know, was afraid to take a chance. HBN has really taken me out of that isolated place. Um, it's given me a sense of connection and hope. Research is now underway to identify the key elements that make hearing voices groups so useful. One factor that seems especially important is that they allow each person to make sense of their experiences using a framework that fits their individual circumstances. The groups also help with specific strategies to cope with distress when it becomes overwhelming. Even people who have experienced significant trauma are living far richer lives as a result of their participation in these groups than what they or others had thought possible. I wanted to share my story that recovery from um, extreme experiences, you know, a true, a real and substantial recovery is possible. And now I get to fly all over the country, do all sorts of things that people thought I couldn't do. I can work full time. I'm uh, creating a life that I want to live. Oh, yeah. The biggest change I would have to say is that I have a sense of, I have a greater sense of purpose. I have a stronger sense of community. Because I know every Wednesday, you know, from 6 to 7.30, there's a place I can go to where there's no judgment, um, where I'm going to be around like-minded people, people who have had similar experiences, where I can share and they're going to share. Even if there are some big emotions that happen in the meeting, you know, we still walk away from it feeling good about each other and about our experience there. And 
we go back out into the world and, and we're able to handle things. There are a lot of different people who have different experiences. You know, for many people, um, being able to talk about what happened to um, a lot of us when we were children or um, the the various sensitivities we've had throughout our lives that we simply haven't understood, um, you know, to help place our experiences and our feelings and our feelings of um, confusion and pain and anger and also of difference, you know, just feeling different and then finding an acceptance, you know, a kind of acceptance in an HVN support group. In the process of trying to heal myself, I have been able to create a space where other people can be healed. If you sit down with people and be, like, sit down and be curious about what they're going through, maybe you'll learn something. Go out there and listen to people. That's all I gotta say. Listen. Be curious. And maybe we could change the world that way. a wonderful opportunity because many times we might get reporters and um, sometimes uh, you know, reporters who, who video things or they write articles and you know they take what they hear and then they kind of write the story they want to write and this was the first time where uh, the majority of people working on that project were people who had personal experience with hearing voices or seeing visions or having unusual experiences. And we got to say, you know, this is the story that we want to put out. And we were part of the editing process. And, and I'll be honest, there were times where we outvoted the academic people in the room and said, no, this is what we feel is really important to put out there in the film. And, and I just want to thank everybody for, for watching it and invite people if they have questions to put them in the chat. I also want to do a shout out to Cindy Dickens, who is from Virginia and does lead an online hearing voices group currently that's based out of Virginia on Sunday nights. And, and perhaps people could uh, connect with her if they're interested in attending a group. And, and there are many other groups as well, but I just want you to know that there are people in Virginia like Jane and like Cindy who have been uh, putting energy into trying to get the hearing voices approach up and running in Virginia. Okay. So how is it, quick question, how has it affected your life? How has HVN affected you? Well, um, basically I didn't have a life before going to the group. Uh, the first group I uh, went to, I walked in and I was on Thorazine because the, uh, the solution as a, uh, that was taught to me by the mental health system in my area was to make the voices go away. And, and for me, you know, no matter what they prescribed, the, the voices didn't go away. Maybe my, my interest in life went away, or, you know, it's not that the voices went away, but it was more like I didn't care. And uh, it was really um, 
wreaking havoc on my neurological system. I was shaking and twitching and falling down. And I thought, you know, maybe there's another way. And in the group, uh, you know, they, they gave me the uh, hope and courage and, and uh, encouragement to actually, instead of running away from my experience, try to look at it and see if I could make sense of it. You know, when do the voices come? What do they come in relationship to? And so it's dramatically changed my life. Uh, you know, now, you know, I'm capable of doing all these things I was not able to do before. And I'm actually actively creating a life that I want to live. Instead of waiting for the next, you know, pill to come out to solve all my problems, you know, I'm taking a much more, much more of an active way uh, to approaching my life. Amazing. Amazing. And what's the easiest way for someone listening to this either tonight or because it's recorded to connect with HVN? So you can uh, email HVNUSA, info at HVNUSA.org. You know, some of those emails were in the flyer for this event. Certainly um, you can email me which my uh, email is also in that flyer or info at westernmassrlc.org or of course reach out to Jane or, or Cindy Dickens and um, you know okay. and, and people who organize this event you know feel free to share my email information. Okay perfect and as Jessica said we will definitely be posting that info so thank you. Um, I'd like to shift a little over to Jane Calloway. Can you tell us a little bit about being a, a friend and family of A Voice here, your experience in going down to Boca Raton last year, or it, going down to Boca Raton, I believe it was earlier this year, um, for the training, um, and give us your thoughts on that. Uh, yes. Um... So I uh, went there because, as everybody knows, if you have somebody with these experiences of voice hearing, it oftentimes affects the family as well. And um, so when, uh, when I went there, um, we had the training of what voice hearers experience and, and you know, similar things that were in the movie, but we had breakouts and we met just with the parents. And part of that is to support the parents, to help with communication and, you know, and share ideas and um, uh, share experiences. And so since I was uh, trained there and back here, I, I really would like to see this happen in the uh, coastal Virginia area. And, um, uh, I don't know when the COVID problems are going to ease up so that we can um, have groups. On the other hand, there are groups that uh, I mentioned earlier, there are groups that are online. And um, as Cindy said, um, the one for friends and family, the one on Monday night is pretty full, but the one on Thursday evening is... Um, uh, there are fewer people, so in other words, you can share your experiences more. And then I would also like to point out that some of the voice, the groups that are for voice hearers are only for voice hearers and parents and friends like me can't be a part of that. And I think those are the ones like Cindy Dickens. Those groups are for voice hearers only. And, um, and I think most of the uh, groups that were on the video that we just, the film we just watched, I think those were voice hearers only as well, sharing their experiences. And, this, uh, this concept of having groups for family members is, is, is um, having these groups that try to follow the HVN values is, is a new concept in this country. We're just uh, getting off the ground, but as Jane said, you know, if I'm in a family and somebody's having a big experience or they're in a lot of distress, it has a ripple effect, right? It impacts everybody in the house 
but sometimes there aren't any services for the rest of the people in the house. So the idea of a, of a family and friends group, I can go in there or, or a, a parent or a brother, sibling can go in there and say, hey, I'm having a hard time finding balance. Gee whiz, you know, sometimes I feel guilty when I take care of myself. And this whole idea of how having permission to say, you know, maybe, you know, I'm frustrated or I'm tired or, you know, I'm going through something and to have a space where you have permission to say, how's this impacting you? Or, how, you know, what are my fears? What am I, uh, what's my grief? What are my hopes? And then are there ways that I can change my relationship to my loved one in a way that works for me and them? And so it's kind of a really neat space to be able to do that. Absolutely. And, and with that, Kevin, I think you're on the line now and would like to hear a little bit from you being a voice here. And you had the opportunity to go to Boca Raton with the Callaway family and um, wanted to know what that experience was like for you. Kevin? Are you on? Kevin, you're not muted, but we can't hear you. So I don't know if you have a volume control. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Adney. Um, I love saying I really enjoyed the experience. Um, for me, it, it really brought different views to my life because I never thought that it would be actual, not just a single, but like a, a good group out there that's just for that. And like going down there with Miss Jane Gall uh, Calloway and her family, um, I really enjoyed everything. You know, um, the training went really good. Um, because for me, being a voice here is really, if I never had any uh, uh, information on any type of hair voices hearing programs, so. When I went down there, I went down there with an open mind, um, clear heart, you know, just to see what it's about, you know. Um, like, I really, I'm really glad that I went down there to seek that type of uh, understanding. Um, and like, like I was saying, being a voice here, when I was coming up, I I thought everybody was, was, it was just like that, you know. Uh, I never thought it was an actual, um, an actual brain um, illness, like you know, with the um, hearing voices and visions and stuff. But um, I really enjoyed it. Kevin, do you think your experience with hearing voices, going down, becoming a facilitator, getting that training, now that you're back in Virginia, has helped you? I mean, I know we've been experiencing COVID, so that connection piece is a little bit fractured, but help you in connecting with others that are voice hearers? Um, and being able to help them, like sort of like how you have been helped by a variety of, of individuals? Yeah, I think I can um, give a more um, understanding of people that have the voices he voice hearing or the family that's dealing with somebody that got a voice hearing because I know I know what it was like trying to look for help but haven't had it. And so now that I can actually help somebody, I feel like that would be the a greater opportunity that I would ever be appreciated of. Okay. Thank you for sharing your experience. Barbie, um, I'd like to answer one of the questions that came up in the chat, if that's okay. Okay, we're, get, we're actually, it, it's all right. We're just, we have one more. We're just going to round it out and we can, we'll open this bad boy right on up. But I just wanted for Jane, um, you're one of, I know your great passion has been to bring Hearing Voice Network here to Coastal Virginia. And if you could, for the audience, but uh, what are the things that you, that need to happen, not that may necessarily you need, but need to happen to bring this 
to be a part of our community framework. If you could share a couple of those things and we can get more and post those, but what the top things that you, you feel we need? Well, what I have agreed to is to uh, put out my email address. And so if there are is anyone who is interested in uh, being part of setting up um, the uh, uh, groups, the hearing voices groups or the friends and family uh, groups, then um, I've, uh, I've got my folder here and I'm gonna keep it all together and keep everybody connected and um, gathering ideas and um, sharing information. There's a wet world of books and information out there that I would be glad to share with people. And I'm looking forward to actually having groups. Fantastic, fantastic. And Thank you. Um, we really appreciate you bringing this passion because what we do with NAMI Coastal Virginia and the kind of supports we have in place, this is such an excellent compliment because it is specific to a group of individuals that our voice hears as well as their family and their loved ones. And sometimes those specifics and that connection on that piece can be so very powerful to in the recovery and to promoting that change, that positive change in someone's life that, as you mentioned, Cindy, you know, didn't have a life before and is able to go forward and, and lead such a, a, an incredible, impactful life. So um, I think what we're gonna do for the questions and uh, Cindy, if you have one in particular you want to uh, address, I know Jessica has been sort of calling some of these questions, but why don't you go ahead of the one you saw that you'd like to address? Yeah, absolutely. So the hearing voices approach is 30 years old. It's kind of new to this country, but there's been research uh, done around voice hearer experiences, and there's this common theme about um, some people have positive voices and some people have, uh, you know, negative voices or, or voices that have mean messages and those voices are usually carrying shame and guilt. They're usually uh, telling people they're unworthy and sometimes these are messages that somebody picked up in their life, you know, either through traumatic experiences or, or social experiences. And for me, my strategy was to not think, feel, or remember my trauma, you know, to try to bury it. And what happened was it, it came out in voices. You know, the voices made me look at the things that, uh, you know, I wasn't processing. And so as people address shame and guilt, as, as they are able to, uh, you know, maybe as a child or in certain areas, we are told, don't tell anybody, or you're causing problems, or just get over it. You know, so being able to actually talk about these experiences can reduce the isolation and the, and the shame and guilt. And lots of people take medication. Uh, the idea though is to have more tools in your toolbox than medication. What are the other things that I can do to navigate this experience beyond taking a drug? Well said, absolutely well said. And um, for some, you know, on this, I know Kevin, you went through the training. What about, we had a question about young people being um, invited into the H, uh, the N network. Can, what is the, what's the age range that I can be to participate if I'm a voice here, a family member? It, uh, it depends on the group, but in, in the Bay Area, there is a specific group for young people. Okay. All right. Um, on that. Um, and then for other questions on that, Kevin, do you have anything you wanted to add? Or do you not consider yourself young anymore? <laughs> no, I'm still young. I'm just, I'm just a little up there though. I'm just a little up there now. <laughs> right, 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 right. 2.0. Right, 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 right. Um, Jessica, was there other questions within no, they're all, the chat's open now for anybody to openly put them in the uh, chat box. I, I have a question, if I may. Okay. Do you have to have a mental health diagnosis 
to hear voices. I, it sounds like no, that, okay. Could you expand on that a little bit, Cindy? Sure, so in the research done, what they found out has been replicated is that one in 10 people at some point in their life will hear voices. That's as common as being left-handed. Now, some people might hear a deceased uh, loved one. Like we do trainings and there'll be people in clinical roles who have never been diagnosed with anything. And then they'll tell a story of uh, losing their grandfather and how their grandfather's voice comes to them in times of stress and guides them. Uh, there are people who have uh, visions and uh, they consider themselves uh, psychics. There are people who uh, talk about being muses that um, like Bob Dylan, you know, you're old enough. I'm old enough to remember Bob Dylan, that song blowing in the wind, it was given to him. You know, he, he sat down, wrote it on a typewriter, no mistakes in one sitting. So some people talk about channeling experiences. And so, yes, in, in the U.S., if you say, I hear voices and, uh, and um, you're not in a church, right, you might get a diagnosis. But if I go to, a, you know, for instance, a Pentecostal church, we are not leaving until the spirit moves the rope. But if I do that on the sidewalk, I may get put in an institution. Does that help you? Yes, thank you. It does. All right, do we have any more questions? If not, um, obviously, Jane, thank you very much for making your contact information so accessible for everyone within our, uh, our community, um, because this is, this is an area, this is a, a, a part of, um, what individuals are experiencing that can be extraordinarily isolating. And as Cindy mentioned, um, as I know from Kevin, because he's a dear friend, um, it doesn't have to be. And there are all of these avenues that one has to access and to utilize. And this is one, but it's an important one um, that we wanna see become a greater part of our framework. Um, Cindy, thank you so much for being part of that film, for sharing that film, for sharing your time with us, because it truly will and does uh, make a difference and it affects um, in such a positive way individuals that um, are struggling and might have felt that they were on their own. Um, Mr. Tevin Clark, as always, um, you are adored and thank you for being um, going in with an open mind and helping anyone that steps in into your path, it it you have affected many more people than you think. Um, and thank you to Ben Williams um, and Jessica for their participation in making this happen. And please, as always, we're here. <laughs> we're here all the time, <laughs> ready and willing to help you all. Um, and yet another an amazing, as, as you said, Cindy, this is another amazing tool in our, in our uh, toolbox that we have, to, we have to use and really, really blow up to help others, you know? So thank you all. And with that, good night. Good night, everybody. All right, good night.